All right, so let's, let's dive in. It says this, And they went to, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. He's talking about Jesus. That's the he. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught to them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in, there, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him, and they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick, or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, uh, this section um, is the, the, the most ground we will cover, um, or up to this point at least, in, in the book of Mark at one time. And uh, what we see is Jesus enters into Capernaum and begins to observe Shabbat, which is just the Hebrew word for Sabbath. And uh, he's doing this with his Jewish counterparts. And on the Sabbath, the Sabbath was a day of rest. It was a day of delight, and it was a day of worship. And so the Jews would often find their way into local synagogues on the Sabbath for customary worship. And so uh, this would involve reading of the scrolls and some sort of interpretation that came from, from usually a rabbi um, there at the synagogue. And one of the most fascinating things about what Jesus does here is, um, is that, one, he's not a well-known rabbi or teacher, okay? So he's not one of these well-known rabbis and teachers that would have been doing this typically, but he steps up and starts doing it. But the most fascinating thing is actually not uh, what he teaches, but it's how he teaches it. And so he teaches it with authority. No rabbis did this. They would often say things like, as Moses said, or as rabbi so-and-so said, and they would never really provide an interpretation that didn't come from somewhere else or from someone else uh, without giving credit to someone else. And, uh, and so for Jesus to be doing this, this is likely one of those moments where we've seen Jesus in other gospels say things like, you have heard it said, but I say to you. When he says that, what he's doing is he's proclaiming his authority over what this text is. He's saying, you've heard it said this way, but I say to you this. And, the, and that, that would indicate that this teaching comes from him, and it's a new interpretation that won't be found anywhere else. It's only coming straight from him. Now, this uh, meant um, for a rabbi to teach on his own authority uh, to teach without someone else's understanding um, would have been like unheard of. Now, you and I, as the reader of Mark, we get to this point and we're like, oh, yeah, we can see why Jesus would do something like that, right? Because this whole time, up until now, we've seen Jesus talking about or being talked about as the Son of God and as the Messiah, right? Verse one, Son of God, right? Jesus' baptism, Son of God. Uh, John the Baptist is proclaiming the coming Messiah. So, so you and I as the reader, we can go, okay, Jesus has the authority to do this, but, for the, but you have to put yourself in the context of where Jesus is at, right? And where he's at, these people are like, this is just crazy. This is just insane. We never have heard anything like this or seen anything like this. It is completely new to them, completely unexpected, and would have left them kind of with their jaws hanging. If that wasn't enough, though, Jesus decides he's going to start casting out some demons. So it's just this really fascinating thing, which um, 
which also was, was not something that people saw very often. Now, rabbis would oftentimes be called in to cast out demons at times, but it was usually this very ceremonial thing. They would wear certain clothes. They would, they would prepare themselves for the task. They would, they would enact some sort of uh, ceremony, but Jesus just speaks. He just speaks and deals with the problem. And it's a really, really powerful thing that he begins to do. And these people are just, they're just flabbergasted. Now, let, let, me just, let me just make a little side note here. This is why I tell people you should always practice Sabbath, okay? Because Jesus does his best work on the Sabbath, if you can't tell, all right? He does his best work on the Sabbath. And that's, uh, I'll tell you, uh, 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 Sabbath is another sermon for another time. But I'll just tell you, like, if you want, uh, I, I believe Sabbath is a place where not only can we be in, engulfed in the, the teaching uh, of Jesus, but we can also find some of the healing and restoration that Jesus puts on offer if we can really find rest in his presence. Um. But then Jesus heads over to Peter and Andrew's house. These are brothers, and uh, apparently Peter and Andrew live with um, Peter's wife and mother-in-law. They all live in one house. James and John are there as well, but Peter's mother-in-law is not doing well, and, and they would have never thought, they would never have thought to come up to Jesus and ask Jesus to do anything to help in this situation, except for the fact that they just saw him do something amazing in the synagogue. And so they come up to him, and they ask him, hey, can you help uh, my mother-in-law? And Jesus gladly does. And then it says that then she just started preparing, like serving them, which I think means that she was preparing a meal. Like we find out later that evening comes shortly after this, or sundown comes shortly after this. So I think she starts serving them, preparing them food. Um, <clears throat> It, it's fascinating to me because, like, um, it just seems like there's something about whenever you are in the presence of God and when you're in the presence of Jesus, um, <clears throat> you, you, when, you, when you realize that he can do something, you just kind of expect that he can do it. And once he does it, you just kind of go on. Let's go to the next thing. Right? Do you see that? Like, there's just, there, there isn't this, like, big show of emotion or anything else like that that happens when Peter's mother-in-law is taken care of. It's just... Yeah, let's let's eat now, right? Like Jesus just did what only He can do. Let's eat. Like let's celebrate that. And um, and so then Sabbath ends. We know Sabbath ends because it says at sundown. And what happens at sundown is people begin to flock to Jesus. They begin to flock to this house. Now you have to think about this again from 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 this kind of cultural mindset. They didn't want to do anything that they would break the law. So they're not going to do anything on Sabbath that would cause them to break the law. But as soon as they had the chance. As soon as they have the chance, they're going to be with Jesus. I love the urgency, right? That first opportunity that they have, they're there. And Jesus does some amazing things. He heals people of unclean spirits, and he, and he heals people of diseases. And it's just this powerful, powerful display of Jesus' power over and authority over chaos. But I've recently, I've been doing a study through uh, Genesis chapter 1, and I can't help but think about Genesis chapter 1 when I read these stories. Um, many of you know Genesis chapter 1 fairly well. Uh, and you'll know that there are lots of repeated phrases and repeated things in Genesis chapter 1. And one of those repeated words and phrases is let. Uh, as God says, let there be. And what this uh, word is, it's actually in the, in the ancient Hebrew language, it's called a jussive. Justive command. Now, the idea of a justive command is that it expresses, it's a gentle expressive command or a, um, uh, expresses a mild command. Uh, the idea behind it is that God summons forth creation gently, allowing creation to kind of become, become what it's capable of being. And, there's no, and, and ultimately, the idea behind the word is that there's no sign of struggle. There's no sign of struggle in trying to create or make something happen. It just, it just gently comes to be from the word of mouth. Now, if you also know anything about Genesis chapter 1, in verse 2, it says that the earth was formless and void. In, the, in Hebrew, uh, that phrase is tovu vavohu, all right? Everybody say that, tovu vavohu. Yeah. You guys, are, you guys are doing great, all right? So let's just stick with the uh, alliteration there. But the idea is, is like it is wild and waste. 
It is wild and waste. There's also the terminology of darkness and then also um, the deep, all right, or what, what is thought of as the watery abyss. Some of your translations may even read deep abyss, okay? Now, this for us, we look at all of those things, the darkness and the wild and waste and the, and the deep abyss. We look at all of these things as three separate entities and three separate things. But to the biblical writer, what this is, is they are, they are writing something to say, like, this is just the way things are. It is one state, and it is displaying the state of chaos. It's displaying the sense of chaos and a, a sense of, of disorder and dismantling and disruption and destitution. And these are the obstacles in Genesis chapter 1 to sustaining and flourishing life. Now, there are a couple neat things about this is that in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, is over the waters, saying that He's right there in the midst of it. The Spirit of God is right in the midst of the darkness and right in the midst of the chaos, right in the midst of the destitution. But the second thing comes with this word let or these phrase let there be. And it's that Jesus can or God can just summon forth creation with a word and there's no sign of struggle. And so if this is true, we have to ask ourselves this question. What does that say about the character of God? What does that say about the character of God if God can just do that? It speaks to the fact that he is gentle, but he also has the power to control whatever he wills, right? But here's, here's, here's the deeper truth. He isn't afraid. He isn't afraid, and the chaos poses no threat to him. It poses no threat to him. Do you see that? And so now fast forward to Mark chapter 1, and you see Jesus doing all of these things, and what do you see? You see this same God in the midst of the dark chaos of his world, and it poses no threat to him. He's not afraid of it. It poses no threat to him. But not only does it not pose a threat to him, but he can actually bend the chaos to his will. And this is what we see over and over and over and over again in the Bible, right? Genesis chapter 1 starts with this dark, chaotic state where God bends it to his will to create uh, what we know of as the world. And, and then you look at the end of Genesis, and the last story we see is this guy named Joseph whose brothers had sold him into slavery. And what does he say? He says, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. Like God can take the chaos and he can bend it to his will. He isn't not, not only does it not pose a threat, but he can actually turn it and use it for his glory. And, um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I've invited a friend of mine, Garrett Simerson, to come and join us. Uh, and uh, Garrett will introduce and tell you a little bit more about himself and his family and those kinds of things here in a, in a moment. But he's one of our missionaries that we support who works with uh, least reached peoples in Southeast Asia. And, um, and so he's stateside right now. And we get an opportunity to share with him because he's here in the States, which is awesome. And so Garrett just has this unique experience that not many of us have. Uh, that he's worked and served in some of the most dark and chaotic places in our world, and yet um, he has seen King Jesus exercise his authority over those places over and over and over again. So if you will, let's welcome Garrett to the stage. Um, So as uh, as we kind of get settled here... um, we're, we're just going to kind of have a conversation about this idea and, and let Garrett kind of share with us uh, some of his perspective and, and offer us some hope, uh, I think, in the midst of some of this. So, but let's, let's just first get to know you a little bit. So sure. just tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your family and, and, uh, and what you do. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll give a, a short testimony and then talk about my family. So I came up in a, a pretty unchurched home. Um, as a young man, espoused a pretty aggressive kind of atheism, and uh, I started a family that way, and about four years into being married, a couple of deployments, I was in the military for 14 years, um, but a couple of deployments and um, uh, a lot of brokenness, and uh, my wife, she, she had enough, and she was, she was going to go, 
and take the kids. And um, I mean, I don't blame her at all. Looking back on it, it was pretty terrible. Um, but uh, in that moment, uh, the Lord um, used that to, to make me wrestle with my worldview. And, uh, and I was by myself. I was actually in Afghanistan deployed at the time. And, um, and after a couple of days of wrestling, I heard a voice say to me, Garrett, you can keep on doing what you've always done, and you know where that will lead, or, or you can follow me, and it'll change everything. And as an atheist, you don't like hearing voices, right? It's not, yeah. it's not super fun. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that day, I, I turned and trusted in Jesus, and I, I came back home. My wife and I started following Jesus together, and, um, and everything changed. Um, uh, and, and about four years into following Jesus, uh, we, we went on a vacation, a vacation to India. I'm not sure how many people go on vacation to <laughs> India, but we just decided we were going to go on vacation to India, and, um, and it was terrible. Um, <laughs> so India, India is an assault on the senses. It's super, super uh, cool, a lot of history, but also a super broken place, um, and, and it, was, yeah, it was a difficult trip. Um, so there's no explanation why my wife on the second day of this trip, uh, jet lagged and just been cheated by like a, a, a tourist tout. Um, she looked across the bed at me and she said, hey Garrett, do you think that God might be calling us into missions? It's, it's, it was an irrational question because we both <laughs> had really good jobs and it was a terrible like international experience. Um, but we both had something stirring in us and we had for a while. And, and for some reason that day, Jennifer just asked that, that really inconvenient question. And I said, yeah, babe, I, I think he might. So that was February 2014. And I, I said, well, babe, let's not superimpose God on this. Let's, uh, you know, as, as the former atheist, I'm still a, a pretty big skeptic, right? Let's go back. Let's pray about this. We got back to, to um, Texas at the time. And... Um, the Air Force came to me and they said, hey, Garrett, uh, would you like to go learn Urdu and Hindi and do like a South Asian studies program? We'll pay for you to go. I was like, well, that's something. And then our local church at the time, we told them, we said, hey, you know, this kind of feeling we have. And I was hoping they'd say, no, you are not cut out for that. But they're like, no, <laughs> it was, it was terrible. Cause they were like, no, we think that's what God's doing too. Um, and so at that point on, we, we prepared uh, to leave my job, uh, to leave my, like, to leave the Air Force. Uh, Jennifer was a nurse at the time, so she resigned. And, uh, and we just went full into preparation for the last three years of my, my contract, to preparing to go um, overseas, uh, first to India. Uh, so we did. We went to India 2018. Uh, we were there for about a year and, uh, and got connected with Point Church at the time. Um, came back and, and helped with diaspora church planting and international, you know, among the international communities of the Triangle for a couple years. Uh, and then uh, in 2021, we, we were trying to get back to India, and they were having their second wave of coronavirus. So, like, everything that we were afraid of happening here actually happened in India. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, you're talking about just in Delhi, 33 million people, right? Just that one city. Uh, and, and they don't have the medical infrastructure we do. And it's a high context culture. People are close together, living in joint family systems. So in May of 2021, they had 4,500 people dying a day in India uh, of corona. And um, on the front page of the New York Times, I'll never forget, it was just a, a picture of the funeral pyres in Delhi on the streets. Um, because that was the only place that was big enough to, to do the funeral pyres. Uh, and Hindus do, they burn the bodies. That's how they do their, their funerals. Um, so we couldn't get back into India. They suspended all visa categories. And I had a buddy in Iraq call me, and he said, uh, Hey, Garrett, God's doing some cool stuff here, and we need some help. Would you mind, you know, you and your family come help until you can get back to India? So it felt kind of like Act 16, right? It was like, uh, you know, Paul tries to go to Asia, the spirit of Christ prevents him. He thinks about going to Bithynia and Jesus says no. And then he has a dream and the Macedonian man says, Hey, come over here and help us. Yeah. And, um, not apples for apples, but it felt really similar. Mm -hmm. And so we went to, to Iraq and we're a part of was a part of the work there. An amazing experience, um, in a really tough place. Uh, Jesus is the same Jesus doing the same things he's always done. 
Yeah. So um, why don't why don't you just why don't you take uh, just give us a couple of like if you don't mind share some sure. stories that you feel like you could share no names or whatever if that's yeah, yeah, you yeah. know protect identities of people that you're working with or worked with but like can you just share some stories of like where you've really seen God at work in this dark chaotic place and how He's still just showing again and again like He's exercising His authority over yeah. that stuff just some of your experience with that yeah I'll I'll give a couple and I'll I'll try to be concise. Um, so one, the fact that Jesus is, is in, in his spirit are still bringing dead people back to life here, there, and everywhere shows that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like family, don't, don't miss, like oftentimes when we think about the power of Jesus, we do, we think about these things of like him casting out demons and healing the sick, but like Derek highlighted the gospel, and like he highlights earlier in Mark 1, the gospel is, is a miracle that, like that, that the Spirit of God uses to bring dead people back to life, and he does it wherever he wants. Mm-hmm. So he does it here. He does it with, uh, with alcoholics. I'm looking for my brother in the room. He does it with alcoholics. He does it with, with just normal dead people like me. Um, he does it with Taliban members. He does it with uh, uh, you know, Islamic State members. He does it with Hindu radicals. He, he takes whoever he pleases, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and that is a miracle, mm. like the <laughs> miracle of salvation. Uh, so I would say, like, first and foremost, like that, that is the, the, the greatest story is just Jesus taking whoever he wants uh, among whatever people he wants. And he'll have them all. Um, but I've, I've seen Jesus move in, in some really incredible ways as he does that. So one story in particular, uh, this was 2018. Um, I was with uh, a friend of mine, and uh, he's a former Buddhist monk. So he had, he had a radical encounter with Jesus, and, um, you know, in, in South Asia, uh, it's, it's a, you know, a collective culture, right? Like you, your identity is tied up with your family, with your community. So he was from a Lama family. Uh, Lamas are, are Buddhist monks. And, and that's, that's what everyone in his family does. So to, to do anything else would be to forsake his heritage. But he had a radical encounter with Jesus, did not become a Buddhist monk. Uh, became a Christian uh, disciple and then a pastor and, uh, and faced a lot of uh, persecution for that. And God used him in, in incredible ways, um, kind of like the Apostle Paul. Uh, so we went to a woman's house one day uh, in, in this particular town where we were, and me and my, my llama buddy, um, <laughs> and uh, this particular woman, uh, she was from an unreached people group called the Marwari people group. So high caste, usually um, pretty wealthy by India standards, and a tiny fraction of a percent Christian. And she, but she was in a predicament because she had a skin disease, and she had been to doctors in Delhi and Calcutta. Um, she had gone to uh, pundits and, and different people doing pujas and different things to try to get better, and none of it helped. And her last resort was to come to a Christian pastor. So she called a friend who called us, and we came over to her house. So we see this woman laying in bed. She has black, like, spots all over her body. It looks like leprosy almost. And, and she says, she tells us the story. She says, look, I'm not looking to convert. I just need someone to pray for me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so Divas, with this, this is his name, with, with, with a... Uh, a courage and a boldness that I did not have. He just looks at her and he says, I'm going to pray for you. And when you are healed, I want you to know that Jesus did this. So, all right, well, let's see what happens. So, so we, <laughs> we pray for this woman and we leave. And, and shortly after that, I came back to the States. Uh, a few months later, I came back to India to, to visit him. And that woman was in the church, healed, and following Jesus. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, share, share another one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just go for it. Yeah, so <laughs> we want to um, keep hearing these things. Like, just keep keep them coming. So I, I, I I'll, I'll say this too. I think that it's really important, family, that as we we read these stories of victory, we know that it comes at a cost. So as a, as a as a former military, current military, I'm still in the reserves. Um, victory always comes at a cost. Good men and women lay down their lives, and the enemy throws everything that he has to try to stop. Hmm. And, 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 and this, is, this is true in a physical sense, right, in, in, in a physical military sense. It is as true in a kingdom sense. If we, if we are seeking to advance the kingdom, it is going to come at a cost. And, and we should not expect that the enemy is not going to lay down everything that he has to try to stop kingdom advance. Yeah, that's right. That is not, that's not metaphorical. Like that, that, is, that is a reality that we face. Paul says that everyone, he tells Timothy, everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer. Um, this thing's flying everywhere, forgive me. Um, so I'll give an example of that. Uh, young man, a Buddhist background guy uh, in the same church as the, you know, the, the pastor I was just sharing a story about. Uh, he comes to faith. Incredible thing. The guy's musically gifted, so he's, he starts leading worship in the church. And uh, we get a phone call. Me and my buddy, my, my, uh, my buddy Divas, we get a phone call again. And he says, hey, Pastor, uh, Brother Garrett, uh, my mom something's happening, we need you to come over, she's very sick, and we think it might be something else. So we go over to his house, and his mom, who is Hindu, is laying in bed, and she is moaning and writhing, and, um, and she looks really bad. And <laughs> she says, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's still, when I think about it, it's pretty overwhelming. But she said, help me. She said, there is, a, there is what feels like, she says, it's like a, a, a baby crawling all over me, biting me from, from head to toe. So she, she's describing this, this phenomenon. She, it's like something crawling on her and biting her all over her body. And she's writhing in pain. Um, when you work in certain parts of the world, these stories in the New Testament are, are true to life. Because the, the enemy is an expert strategist and tactician. He plays to our doubts. He plays to our fears. And I think that's one reason why we, we don't see as much of this here, because he knows us very well as Western people. He knows this isn't how he's going to get us. He's going to get us with comfort. He's going to get us with security. He's going to get us with those things. But, but in the East... In the global east and the global south, man, he gets people real good with some of these things that we're seeing in Mark 1. And so this woman, um, she, uh, yeah, we just, we, we lay hands on her and we, we prayed for her. But she actually, she, she wasn't initially completely healed. You know, Jesus says that some of, some of these are only cast out with prayer and fasting. And so that was actually one that took some time of prayer and fasting. But she's better now. So we have a very, very real enemy, but we also have a very real risen and reigning Savior who is sovereign and who is taking ground for himself and for his namesake. He's doing it right now, guys. He's doing it here, and he's doing it there. So um, obviously, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of things transpire, especially over on the eastern side of the world, um, in in you know Israel and Palestine and, and those kinds of things, I think it would be to be talking about something like this and not talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I think would be maybe doing disservice to the idea that you know God is at work in the midst of that. Um, so, um, do you think, just from your perspective, what's maybe like a it, because I think we all kind of have this sense of, like, I, I talked to somebody this past week, um, and their comment was, yeah, man, like, World War III is coming. Uh, you know, that was their thought. Um, and, and I just, w but what, what hope can we take uh, knowing, you know, what's going on right now 
in other places in the world? What hope can we take um, in the gospel and in, and in just Jesus ruling and reigning and mm-hmm. still having authority? And that this, like whatever dark, chaotic situation is going on, like he's not afraid of it. Yeah. And, and he's, he's going to, um, and, he, and he's, uh, it's, it's not a, it's not a threat to him. Right. No, that, that's exactly, that's it, right? Like, he, he is calling order out of chaos. Mm. He is like, what, what we have destroyed, he is bringing back together, right? Like, we are going from, from the garden he created to the garden that's waiting for us. Mm. Um, and, and this is where, like, we as a people need to be very, very cognizant, <laughs> deliberate about where, where we place our hope and what our identity is. Mm. Um, we have, we have elections coming up next year, right? There's, there's a lot of talk, a lot of buzz, a lot of people that are, are bidding and, 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 and crafting messages to get our attention and to get our allegiance right now. But as kingdom people, our allegiance needs to be to one king. And it's not to say that, that we don't have political convictions and all that, but we need to have allegiance to one king and know what our objectives are and what our identity is. And family, if you're sitting here and you follow Jesus, then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that you are a new creation and an ambassador, right? right? And like, and, and you, God, God is, Paul also says there that, that he has given you the ministry of reconciliation. Mm. Like, Jesus, as Jesus brings everything into order, like, it's going to the garden, y'all, and it's going to be every tribe, tongue, and nation. Some of those guys that are in Hamas right now are going to be there in the garden with you. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and we are the ministers of reconciliation. That's the hope. Like the, when, when I look at Hindu nationalism in India, when I look at the Taliban in Afghanistan, the two major places where we work, when I look at the, the, the scourge of, of Islam and, and violence, and I'll just say that, like, I have lots of Muslim friends, y'all. So don't, don't think that I'm, I'm talking about Muslim people but the scourge that we see in the Middle East, Central Asia, North Africa. Like, guys, our hope is not in eradicating uh, a, a, a people or a place. Our hope is in reconciliation through Christ Jesus, like for his glory through all peoples for eternity. That, and that's God's heart. And so that, that's, the, the hope is the gospel, man. The hope is that Jesus is bringing, like, through the gospel and, and, and through us, <laughs> <laughs> like the, he's bringing all that into order and he's not threatened by it one bit. Actually, I love this, this passage of Mark 1 because you know, like now it's Halloween, right? Halloween time. And so you got all these movies coming out, right? Um, you have, and, and they're all, have you noticed like some of the newer ones? They're like, why are they all like blatantly satanic? Like blatantly sacrilegious, taking what is good and what's meant to be holy and making it profane like the Conjuring series, the Nun series, the Exorcist. And the new Exorcist is like the old one plus. It's, like, it's pretty, pretty hyped, pretty in, intense. They always make Satan look so awesome, like so powerful. But when Jesus shows up in the Gospels, he, the, the, the demons beg Jesus not to hurt them. <laughs> right? Like it's not a contest. <laughs> like it, it's not like they show up and like let's go like it's Mortal Kombat you know like, like no like Jesus shows up and they're like have you come to destroy us before the appointed time hey would you please send us into some pigs would you have mercy on us please please don't hurt us like he's not threatened by this y'all and we shouldn't be either that's great yeah that's great you guys excited about Garrett <laughs> um, yeah um, so Garrett, I, I just want to, um, you, you are serving, um, in a, in a situation and in a circumstance that many of us are not serving, uh, or, or at least, uh, don't have the experience of serving. Maybe we'll be called there as well at some point. Um, but I think it's, I think it's important that we as a church know, cause we support you and your family, um, financially, but also we want to support you guys with prayer. Um, so we believe in that. We believe in the power of intercession. We believe that battles are won uh, based on the intercession of, of God's people. And so, um, so how how can we you know be praying for you and your family and um, in the work that you guys are doing? What are the things that we can um, have front of mind as we go before the throne and and um, 
lift up our prayer and con- our, our prayers and concerns, how can we also remember you in that? Yeah, I think I think maybe three things. Um, and this is this is off the cuff. I didn't prepare three things. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I think there's three things. Um, I think one is for God to lead uh, me and my partners in South and Central Asia to God prepared people. We have a, a project right now uh, that we've shared with Lake Springs, uh, where we want to train a thousand Afghan believers to find ten catalytic leaders in country so we can see a thousand Afghan people come to Christ. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to find fourth soil people, right? You know, we talk about like the four soils, right? Well, I want to find fourth soil people that are going to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. So just praying that God would lead us to, to God prepared people um, in South and Central Asia. Uh, the second thing would be wisdom as I, as I coach my brothers there, that I would have wisdom and, you know, in, in clarity. And, uh, and the third thing would be just that, you know, we're, we, we've come back to the States uh, for a short season. Hope, we'll see if it's a short season. I'm, I'm not sovereign. <laughs> so, but we've, we have come back to the States for a time to take care of some family needs. Um, so just prayers that God would, uh, would provide for our family while we're here. Um, it's, uh, I was telling Derek when I got back, I was like, y'all, I wasn't prepared for like for the economy in America like we came from like South Central Asia we landed here and, and I, we like we walk into Starbucks and it was like that'll be eight dollars I was like for one drink yeah <laughs> you know we I like I walk into to like to buy a car right and it, and it was like uh it was like I don't know I, I felt like I was buying like a luxury car and it was like a beater you know just with the price you know what I mean um so so yeah just prayers that that the Lord would provide for our family that would be that'd be good too. Yeah. All right. Well, shall we do that, church? Yeah. Let's uh, let's bow and let's pray together. <clears throat> God, we uh, we thank you so much for um, just the power of your word and the power of the gospel. Um. To encounter um, a brother like Garrett and pull him out of um, sin and darkness and lead him to uh, marvelous light in you and in your son. And God, we praise you for the ways in which you're using Garrett and using the people that he's training and coaching uh, to, to bring your kingdom to be ministers of reconciliation in our world that is broken and dark and chaotic. Uh, But God, you have filled us with your spirit, the one that hovers over the chaos. You filled us with that spirit to empower us to be your people and to be um, your ministers of reconciliation that bring forth your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so God, we, we pray that you uh, continue to do that in us and in uh, the work that Garrett is doing and the people he is training. God, we pray for uh, you to bring them, uh, those, those fourth soil people who are able to really produce 30, 60, 100 fold what... Um, is sown into them. And, uh, and God, we, we pray that you will reach thousands upon thousands of people in Afghanistan and South Asia um, j- just through, just through a catalytic move of your spirit in the hearts and lives of people who just recently had no idea who you were. And, uh, and God, we pray that you um, be with Garrett and his family as they, as they um, try and, and care, uh, not just for others in this world, but, but the, 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 the others that you've put most closely to them to, to, to shepherd and to mold and to love on, which is their family. Uh, be with them as they try and... Uh, do whatever they can to make sure that they're 
their family is cared for and loved um, and, and, and has everything that they need. God, we pray that you would provide uh, through supernatural means, um, through, through generous people, through, um, through just generous churches, that you would continue to provide for Garrett and his family, that they might uh, keep doing the work because we can, we can all see that Garrett has been set apart for this purpose. Um, and so we just, we, we want him to be able to do this. We want him to be able to dedicate his time and attention and focus to building your kingdom. So God, just uh, provide so that that can happen. And um, God, we, we know, we know that um, when you pray, or when we pray to you, I'm sorry, when we pray to you, God, that you hear us, that you hear our cry because of your love and because you came and that you reconciled us to yourself through your death on the cross. And so, God, we, we are so grateful and we are so thankful that we can even come before your throne with confidence, knowing that you hear us, that you listen to our hearts and our cries, and, and that, that, you might, that you might move and work because of the prayers that we lift up. And so, God, we... We ask you to, to hear us now and, uh, and move in a mighty way, as only you can do. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you all thank Garrett one more time for being with us today? Thanks, man. Appreciate you.